Professor Adam Thompson, and in this ECG case review, uh, we're going to look at a 12 lead from a 74-year-old female that went into a doctor's office after having some chest pain and some nausea and vomiting for the past five days. After just one look at the 12 lead, the physician decided to call 911 uh, due to his concerns, and uh, the patient was then treated by EMS. When EMS arrived, the patient was laying on an exam bed. Uh, her skin was cool and clammy. Uh, she was in no obvious respiratory distress, however. You know, she had a respiratory rate of about 14 breaths per minute, just laying there in no obvious distress. Her blood pressure was relatively stable for her, 112 over 80. Her pulse was 88 and regular. And her Glasgow was 15. She was compass menace, answering all questions appropriately. And actually, at that time, she was pain-free. The only thing that had been done up to this point was the uh, physician gave her uh, 324 milligrams of aspirin. So she's only received aspirin at this point, no nitrates or anything like that, no opioids, uh, and she is now pain-free. So here's her 12 lead that EMS captured, okay? And try to look at this 12 lead systematically, okay? And first, you're going to identify the rate and the rhythm. And, and we know the rate, again, is normal. Uh, you could see that there's about three small boxes between uh, the QRS complexes and, and then a little bit more. And we said her rate was about 80. All right. And then you're going to want to identify the rhythm. Her rhythm is very regular, rate of 80. You do have obvious P waves okay, before every QRS complex, and the PR interval is consistent. And the P waves are upright and leads 1, 2, and 3 indicating a sinoatrial focus, and there's a slight delay in that PR interval, making it a sinus rhythm with a first degree AV block. So we have a sinus rhythm with a first degree AV block, and that's not overly concerning. Um, then you're going to look at the patient's axis, and you see the QRS complex is positive in lead one and mostly positive in AVF. So we have a normal QRS axis. Moving on. Uh, looking for any morphologies or, uh, you know, anything else wrong with the intervals. I don't see a severely prolonged QT interval or any bundle branch block or LVH type morphologies that would concern me. Looking for my STEMI mimics or my ST T wave changes and my ST segment elevation, right? And, of course, we do notice uh, ST segment elevation on this 12 lead. If you've been looking at 12 leads for any period of time, you, you, it should pop out at you. And where do you see that ST segment elevation? Mostly over here in these inferior leads, 2, 3, and AVF. These are our inferior leads, and they are contiguous of each other. All right, so if you had a uh, STEMI criteria that said you need at least one millimeter of ST segment elevation and two or more contiguous leads, you've got that, okay? But you want to make sure it's not a mimic and you're not, you know, calling early repolarization or acute pericarditis or anything like that. You don't, you don't want to call those. Uh, STEMIs and, and take them to the cath lab for no reason. So looking further at this, anytime you see ST segment elevation in these inferior leads, immediately look at AVL. AVL and, and lead 3 are the two most reciprocal leads on a 12 lead EKG. So you look over at AVL, and sure enough, you see ST segment depression. And then lead 1 is contiguous to AVL, and you also see a little bit of ST segment depression. Okay, and I'm going to go a little bit further into this. So if you're not seeing these changes, I will kind of point them out for you. But I'm going to tell you enough uh, that once you see that ST elevation in 2-3 AVF and ST depression in AVL, you have enough right there to call that patient a STEMI or to assume that they're having an acute myocardial infarction. So look, again, looking at this further, let me just show you what I'm talking about with ST segment elevation. Okay, so you have your QRS complex, right about, stops right about there, and then you want to identify what we call the J point, okay? And your J point is where the QRS complex ends, okay? It's the very end of the S wave or the QRS complex, so I'm just going to identify the J point in these three leads, okay? And then what you're going to want to do is find your isoelectric line, and I typically look uh, between the TP segment for the isoelectric line, so that would be in lead one up here, it's right there, it's right about here in lead two, and right about here in lead three, and then you're going to want to continue that all the way over to the QRS complex, 
and then you can see that the J point is above, I kind of went off track there, the J point is above, it's elevated above that line indicating ST segment elevation because that is your ST segment between the QRS complex and the T wave, right? So you have ST segment elevation, you want to know about how much. Okay, this 12V makes it a little bit difficult because uh, it's missing a line here. But you have about uh, 3 millimeters of SC segment elevation here in lead 3. And coincidentally, you have about 2 millimeters, 2 millimeters of ST segment elevation here in lead 2. And then, of course, those reciprocal changes I pointed out, looking at AVL, you could find the J point here. And it, let's say you can't find the J point in AVL because it's too diffuse. It's too hard to discover. Um, just find it in a lead above or below it. So right here in AVR. Just move AVR right there. Um, you could find the J point right there. It's on that bold line. Makes it nice and easy. So just follow that line down to AVL, and that's where your J point would be, right about there. And you can see, of course, that is below the isoelectric line, indicating ST segment depression, right? And that's a common pattern with inferior wall in FARCs is ST segment elevation in your inferior leads and ST segment depression in the high lateral leads, at least in AVL because it's so reciprocal of, of you know, lead three. And then you may have noticed, if, if you've got a keen eye, that there's some changes over here in these right precordial leads, uh, especially V2 and V3, and we're going to discuss those in a few slides. So really quick, before you move on, when you, when you identify elevation, okay, um, you should have a differential for that. So there are different causes of SC segment elevation. And this is a nice differential list because it spells out the word elevation. It makes it really easy. So first thing is electrolytes, okay, electrolytes. And one of the easiest ways to kind of rule out electrolytes, obviously, is if you're at the hospital getting, you know, a blood panel and then looking at their, their serum potassium levels. And that's really one of the big ones you're looking for is their potassium levels. Um, so if they had severe hyperkalemia, like a, a really high serum potassium, um, you may see something like a peaked T wave or a sine wave, widening of the QRS. All of these things um, indicate uh, hyperkalemia or may, may indicate hyperkalemia. Um, you could also have uh, prolonging of the QT interval, uh, you know, all of these different derangements. But we don't see any of that on this 12 lead. So and we don't have really a patient that has, you know, a history of renal failure or any cause of electrolyte derangement. So we're going to rule that one out for now. Left bundle branch block can cause ST segment elevation. You could quickly rule that one out because this QRS complex is not wide enough. It is not wide enough. So this is not a left bundle branch block. Early repolarization. That can be a difficult uh, mimic. So we want to look at this 12 lead for any signs of early repolarization. The problem is early repolarization will not cause this ST segment depression. Okay, especially over here in V2 and V3. V2 and V3 with early repolarization generally have some elevation. In fact, even without early repolarization, V2 and V3 may have about half a millimeter of ST segment elevation. So that's not the case here. Ventricular hypertrophy, ventricular hypertrophy, LVH especially, can cause a strain pattern that looks a lot like an MI. But again, with, with that strain pattern, you would have elevation over here in V2 and maybe in V3, and then depression uh, in V5, V6. You're not seeing that. The QRS complexes aren't, uh, you know, there's not a whole lot of high voltage indicating, uh, a, a, you know, chamber enlargement or LVH. So we can rule that one out. Oh, went the wrong way. Let's rule that one out. And then we have aneurysm. Aneurysm is a tough one to rule out, but typically the way like a left ventricular aneurysm presents, it's that that's somebody that had had a uh, big MI in the past and now they have persistent patterns. But typically that would present with these uh, SC segment elevations, not so much depression. It would still have some elevation. Um, so when you see depression like this, you can kind of say this is probably not due to an old infarct. So we can rule out the aneurysm. Treatment. Well, we're not performing any, you know, like an acute or uh, like a pericarditis for acute tamponade or anything. So we can rule that one out. Injury. That includes acute myocardial infarction. So let's keep that one on there because we have nothing to rule that out. Uh, Osborne waves, certainly uh, these are not Osborne waves. An Osborne wave is like what we call sometimes a J wave. 
because it happens at the J point and it's due to hypothermia and occurs right about there. If you look over here at these uh, precordial leads, the left precordial leads, V4, 5, and 6, I kind of drew what an Osborne wave looks like. And that's not what this looks like over here in the inferior leads. That's ST segment elevation. That's certainly not Osborne waves. And Osborne waves are caused by hypothermia. So the easiest way to rule that out is a thermometer. All right. So let's get rid of that. And then non-occlusive vasospasm. And that can be another difficult one. This causes something called Prince Metals Angina. A lot of times this is due to somebody that's on stimulants. Um, so you want to rule that out. Uh, and, and, and again, that one's a difficult one to rule out. So you, you keep that in your differential. But with this 74-year-old female that went to a doctor's office after five days of symptoms, it's most likely not going to be that. Um, and we're left with that acute myocardial infarction. Uh, so that's what is going on here. We, we most likely are dealing with a true STEMI, especially when we see that pattern of inferior elevation and those reciprocal chains. So again, burn this pattern into your mind if you haven't already. So there's a couple things that you could you could look at even further with this uh, inferior wall pattern. Um, whenever you see an inferior wall MI, your next concern should be potentially a right ventricular infarct because a right ventricular infarct can be somebody that is preload dependent and you would want to avoid administering any nitrate to that patient. So you wouldn't want to give them nitroglycerin um, because you can bottom out their blood pressure. The right side of their heart uh, effectively becomes a conduit and, and is very reliant on that preload. So if you happen to give them nitro and, and you did bottom out their blood pressure, quickly give them fluids to increase their preload and that should hopefully reverse uh, the iatrogenic, uh, you know, hypotension that you cause. So looking at this, uh, you could actually tell if this is more indicative of a right-sided MI versus a left-sided MI without doing a right-sided 12 lead. A right-sided 12 lead is when you take uh, V3 and V4 electrodes and just kind of mirror them over to the right side of the chest. Uh, and you can do that. And, and, you know, if you have the indication to do that, go ahead and do that. But I can tell you really quickly that this uh, 12 lead is indicative of a right-sided MI just simply because I see that there's more SC segment elevation in lead 3 than there is in lead 2. If you understand how the leads look at the heart, lead 3 looks from more the right leg towards the left shoulder. That angle is kind of the angle that uh, lead 3 looks at the inferior wall of the heart, where lead 2 looks more from the left leg towards the right shoulder. So you got lead 3, right leg to left shoulder, is looking at the heart that way, um, and lead two is looking more from the left leg towards the right shoulder. Those are the angles. It's not exactly the electrodes. So that is the electrodes that lead two uses. Um, I don't want you to comment and say, hey, lead three also uses the left leg. I know. I know that. All right. I'm just trying to explain the angle of view of the inferior wall that, the, that they're looking at. So lead three looking more to the right than lead two. So if you see elevation in lead three, that is more significant than the elevation in lead two, that's indicative of a right ventricular infarct. You may want to avoid nitrates. Base it off of their blood pressure as well. This you know, patient's blood pressure wasn't uh, really that high to begin with, so you're going to want to be careful. All right. Another thing that you're going to want to look at is what we looked at in these precordial leads over here. We saw that SC segment depression in V2 and V3. What do you think that is? This is not reciprocal to the inferior wall. Okay. V2 and V3 are not reciprocal to 2, 3, and AVF. It just isn't. What they are is they're reciprocal to the posterior wall. All right, so this patient may uh, ha be having a posterior wall infarct, and that kind of fits, right? Because the RCA, or the right coronary artery, is the artery that provides most of the blood flow to the inferior wall in most patients, especially that right ventricle, okay? And in also most patients, in 85% of people, the RCA wraps around to the back of heart, the heart and provides blood flow to the PDA or the posterior descending artery. We call that a dominant RCA. All right, so the right coronary artery usually provides blood flow to both the inferior wall, the right ventricle, and the posterior wall. So it makes sense that we would see posterior wall changes here. In fact, that might be the first thing you see. And if all you saw was this, you know, a V1, V2, V3, and you saw those ST segment depressions, and let's say 2, 3, and AVF were all isoelectric, that would be a good indication to do a posterior 12 lead because then you would have your criteria or potentially have your criteria to call STEMI alert, activate the cath lab, and expedite patient care. So some people have said if you look at 
uh, the 12 lead, you know, uh, you know, hold, hold it up at the light, look at it from the back and hold it upside down or, or whatever. Um, just kind of flip it in your head and reverse it. And that's what you're really looking at from the posterior wall. So over here on the left, that's what it looked like on the 12 lead. And then we flipped it uh, upside down and then reversed it. So now you can see that those uh, R waves are actually, in fact, Q waves. When you look at them posteriorly, big Q wave. And then uh, ST segment depression is now ST segment elevation, right? So you might be asking, what's he talking about with this posterior 12 lead stuff? Uh, I don't have any posterior electrodes. Uh, well, you would have to modify your electrode placement, just like you do with a right-sided 12 lead. You would take uh, a few of the electrodes, uh, you know, from the precordial leads, V4, V5, and V6, okay? And then you're going to wrap them around to the back. V4 is going to go on the posterior axillary line, just like in the picture here, okay? And you're going to stay at the same level that you were at with V6 before. All right, and then V5 is going to be mid-scapular. So palpate the patient's scapula. One easy way to do this is lift their uh, left arm, and you can actually kind of feel where the bottom of the scapula is when you do that. And then uh, V6 will become V9, and that's going to be paraspinal. So palpate the spinal process, and then stay a little bit to the left of that um, so you, know, you don't have the bone in between the heart and, and the electrode causing a much clearer picture. All right, so... And, and then when you print out the 12 lead, cross out V4, V5, and V6 and put in V7, V8, and V9. So anybody that looks at that 12 lead knows it's a posterior tracing. So here's a look at the angiogram from that 74-year-old uh, female, uh, both before and after she was catheterized. So here's before, all right? That is the RCA you're looking at there. All right, and, and if you've never looked at these before, it might be difficult, but you can see right there, there's a big gap in the middle of that right coronary artery, and she's still getting some perfusion, so that means it's severely stenosed. It's almost completely occluded, so they call that like a 90 to 95% blockage. It's not good, right? So that's what's causing the myocardial ischemia and injury, and then if you look over here after they uh, reperfuse her, Look at that Look, nice blood flow all the way through this thing. And of course, you're getting a much better perfusion to that myocardium. And if you look at both, you can s simply see the big difference. Um, obviously, you know, it's even darker down here because the blood flow is much stronger down here. And you can see here it's a little bit lighter um, due to the lack of perfusion that severely stenosed coronary artery. Um, so getting a reperfused. Uh, potentially, you know, obviously did uh, end up saving a lot of myocardium and uh, her quality of life.